Hi, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to talk about witnessing the resurrection. We're going to talk about the resurrection of Christ. It is Resurrection Sunday. And we want to focus on witnessing the resurrection in your life. And I want you to stay tuned because this is very important for the the shift of Christianity that needs to happen needs to happen first and foremost in your life. It can't happen somewhere else. It has to happen with you. And we're going to talk about that. If you enjoy the content here and you want to see it continue, you want to see it continue ad-free especially, we invite you to support the channel. The details to do so are in the description below. It takes a lot of time, sp uh, time space, resources uh, in order to plan and deliver this kind of content. We are not copying anybody else. We're not following any gated institutional narrative or any party line from what comes out from any kind of Sunday school literature or or domination, or statement of faith, or creed, or seminary, or anything like that. We just It's just me and you. We are going raw. We are looking at the Bible, and we're using the Bible to figure out how we can live lives that are more like Jesus Christ, okay? We want to take the wisdom of Jesus Christ, the wisdom of the Logos, and we want it to flow through us and everything that we say and do. And so if you want to see this continue, uh, we invite you to support the channel. The details are in the description below. So thanks for everybody who's doing that, making all of this possible. Now we're around Resurrection Sunday. People call it Easter Sunday. People call it Resurrection Sunday. Um, there are people who get all wrapped around the axle about not using the word Easter. We're going to call it Resurrection Sunday. And I used to be one of those people. I used to get really worked up about that, about Halloween, about some stuff with Christmas. I've been through several phases here. And I really think that getting all wrapped around, getting all uptight about exactly what it's called or exactly how you do and don't celebrate and denigrating Easter eggs and Christmas trees, all this kind of stuff. People, it's disorienting and people are missing the point. What's happening culturally, culturally, the entire culture pauses to celebrate a holiday. And at a bare minimum, what that is for you, if you're a Christian, what that is for you, it's an opportunity to have a conversation. It's an opportunity to open up to have dialogue with somebody because there's that event. And regardless of what anybody believes, everybody knows. Like when you walk into Walmart, when you walk into any store, everything's decorated for Easter stuff. You see Christian stuff everywhere. You see Easter eggs and, and, you know, bunny rabbits everywhere. It is an opportunity, just like you might talk about the weather and do small talk, it is an opportunity to have conversations with people and discuss these kinds of things. And I am the kind of person who I would recommend that we welcome all kinds of opportunities to have conversations with people, especially in good faith. Now, in our FSI, in our FSI last Wednesday night, we actually assigned homework for people to read an article on the Consilience Project about good faith communications. I think it's the most recent article on the Consilience Project. And if it's not, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll be able to see it if you want to go there and read that. But what you're looking for is opportunities to have conversations with people. Um, whether you call it Easter, Resurrection Sunday... I, I don't think we should get wrapped around the semantics and all that. Easter is a star day, all that kind of stuff. So I want to talk about this kind of thing for a second. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. Cause, and I want you, what, because I want you to get away from this kind of thing. Specifically, when I'm doing a video, you may not realize, I don't do videos just to do videos. I do videos specifically because I'm thinking of you and I'm thinking of a way in which you need to change. I'm thinking in ways in which I need to change in ways that I have changed in the past, and I want people to start doing smarter, better, wiser things, making wiser, better choices in their life, and diminishing suffering, and letting the light of the Logos, Jesus Christ, shine through you more clearly, okay? So I want you to listen closely. When I put out videos, I want you to listen closely to what I say, because if you take heart to what I say, you can clarify you can become more clear as a lens through which jesus christ can shine to other people that is the goal here that's the absolute goal and we tend to be holding on to things uh, in, in ephesians chapter 5 verse 3 uses the word uncleanness there's two words uncleanness and filthiness 
and and the uncleanness is is the kind of things that we need we're holding on to that need to be shed and we need to get rid of forgetting those things which are behind and pressing toward the mark looking forward to those things which are before we need to forget some of the things which are behind so as we're in this season we just passed good friday and we hear a lot of conversations about things like things <laughs> make sure that isn't that isn't going got something else which you, you would hear my guitar over there if i were to push that button <laughs> Um, we look at the calendar. Christ, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. And he resurrected on the 17th. And then people want to... And so there, there is an Old Testament precedence for these days coming along to take time to set aside and recognize them, okay? When you had Passover, when Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, it was on Passover. There's all these arguments about when you should do Lord's Supper, that's those kinds of things. But all these things were all set on a calendar, okay? So having something set on a calendar where you remember what Jesus did and, and the story, the narrative of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of that. And then I see people getting in all these arguments about about was Jesus crucified on a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Friday? And let me tell you this. I, I, the, I actually made this one on the left. This is something I saw floating around. Actually, Paula saw it floating around on the internet. This over here on the left is something that I replicated out of uh, Bullinger's companion Bible, out of his appendices. He has it on a Wednesday. And if I took the time to do that, you can guess where my opinion lies. But here's what I want to say about this. Um, if you are in the comments section or in the chat section right now and you're all of a sudden starting to blurt out when you think um, Christ was crucified, whether it was Wednesday or Friday or Thursday or something like that, that's what I'm trying to get you away from, you see? I'm trying to get you away from pounding down these opinions of certain kind of propositions like that that in, in some degree, to some degree, are kind of like arguing about the number of angels that can dance on the head of a pen, okay? And if I had 10,000 people, like in the days of Gideon, remember the qualifier there, God was telling Gideon which people to pick, and he said, okay, the ones that get down and lap it up like a dog straight from the water source with their tongue, we're not picking them. We want to get the guys who are scooping up with their hands. It, it, text doesn't tell you why. People, you know, post-talk rationalize why, but text doesn't tell you why. Well, if, if you, when I mention baptism or things like this, what day the Lord was crucified on, if you automatically take to the chat in the comment section, you have to prove your viewpoint on that particular thing and you get off track of what we're actually trying to talk about, you are, you are the people who are down there lapping up with your tongue. And what I'm trying to get to you, what I'm trying to do with you, I'm trying to transition you from that kind of person into the kind of person, into one of the 300 that Gideon had, you know, picking up with their hand and lapping it. You want to be one of the 300. I'm trying to transition you into one of the 300. There are so many different things that Christians say they believe. And so <laughs> recently, and I really want to talk about this concept of beliefs as as propositions that you affirm and agree with and concur and attest to or assent to that kind of thing i want to move away from that concept of a belief more toward a type of belief or faith that is a that is a commitment that is a, that is sensing, sensing the tension between you and all of the real things in life like relationships and connections with other people and the, and with that which is ultimately real which we would say is god and with your set of values, we're going, that connectedness where you have meaning, we're going to call that faith. And when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not, uh, it's not just an assent, not just a mental assent or an affirmation that he existed or that he rose from the dead. It is, it is a commitment to being in active union and in attunement with the flow of the Logos, with, with how it moves in and around our lives. And, and to commit your life in love to bring meaning out of, all the, out of all the possible connections you can possibly have with everything by, by lacing those invisible tensions with the logos in every way that you possibly can. Realizing that taking on responsibility. So this, I was talking to somebody recently 
about 1 Corinthians 15, and they were, they were talking about the beliefs aspect of it. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But I really want to, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm on a crusade to get Christians to very specifically transition away from just thinking, not away from, but away from just thinking about Christianity as a safety from peril in the afterlife. Because there is so much more to Christianity that we are not taking advantage of. So all these things that we have beliefs about, we have beliefs and these, these propositions and these things, and, and you think sound doctrine is a list of things to believe, it is not. It's a policy, principle, or procedure by which we should behave. You think about the Truman Doctrine, the Bush Doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine. That's what I want you to think of when you think of doctrine. I want you to think about how you act and move. And imagine like you're in a river and you know how to move with it to get where you need to go. Or you're in a sailboat and you know how to be in attunement with the wind. Use the sail to be in attunement with the wind and you're interacting with it. That is what we do with wisdom. That is what we do with the logos. We interact with it in such a way to where we move in the right direction. And we, and we have a good sense of that. What is happening on this Resurrection Sunday, on this Easter, is everybody whether they really want to or not, because Easter resurrection, because it's so pervasive in our culture. I'm in the United States. I don't know exactly what it's like elsewhere. I lived in Italy for two years, and the Bon Pasqua thing was a really big deal there too. So I'm pretty sure in Europe it's a pretty big deal. In a lot of places around the world, I know the Eastern Orthodox separ- uh, celebrate it one week off from where we do, and the exact date that it's celebrated isn't the point. The point is that everybody's looking to this thing. There's this passage in scripture. For consider him that endeared such a con- such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. It's one of the strongest verses in the Bible because what a what a Christian should do and what a non Christian should do, the the right thing to do for anybody is to consider him. Consider Jesus Christ, who endured such a contradiction of sinners. What where did that take place? right up to the cross, and then leading into the resurrection, okay? That's, that's the main thing. Consider that when you consider that. That should affect everything you do. It should cause you to stop. If Christ, unless you be weary and faint in your minds, you may want to quit, okay? But the Christian life is about, it's not about believing certain things. It's about being like Christ. Being. It's not about having beliefs. It's about being, okay? It's not about having, like marriage isn't about having a wife, It's about being a husband, okay? It's not about having kids. It's about being a father. The Christian life is not about having beliefs or having a belief system. It is about being like Christ in the way that you be. So consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners. Though things were not his fault, he voluntarily adopted the responsibility to take on all all the missings of the mark, all the sin, if you will all the harmatia, that ever were or ever would be. He took it upon himself. That's responsibility and bearing the cost of the responsibility. That's the pattern. And the pattern for a Christian is to bear the responsibility, to bear that responsibility. The pattern of a Christian is to, is to find a place that you can take up responsibility and take it. And you also wind up bearing the cost of that responsibility in the meantime. Today, Saturday the 16th, I came across this Facebook post where somebody said, and this is in in a Christian versus atheism Facebook group. And I've been kind of lately experimenting with these people with different kinds of thoughts to see what kind of answers that I get. And this one person said, you know why atheists don't want to believe in God? They don't want to feel accountable to anybody. Now, I made a couple of comments on this, and my first couple of comments were like, you don't know why atheists are atheists, so you don't, as a Christian, you don't want to, you don't want to assign a moral reason to them. That is not interlocuting in good faith, okay? You might want to talk to any particular atheist and find out why they are an atheist, but to just say atheists don't want to believe in God because they don't want to feel accountable to anybody... There's all kinds of atheists who were in the thread talking about all the things they are accountable. And and then, oddly enough, including to their future self, which is one of the things that we advocate on here. Um, So this one 
atheist said, we take responsibility for our actions and not blame it on an invisible sky daddy for our failures in life. Which if, you know, if you were a Calvinist, you could do that. You could rightly do that. Calvinists would reject that, but Calvinists are cognitively dissonant. If you were a Calvinist, you, you could blame it on God. God would be this source of your failures. But it's very sad to me that an atheist's, responsi- an atheist's response to a Christian saying this was that they take responsibility and we don't. I was talking about this with Paula earlier, and this is completely backwards. If you're a Christian, then above all people, we have the reason to take responsibility. We have the supreme example of the person who took the most responsibility anybody could ever take. And that's the person we're supposed to follow. But people have the impression that we don't take responsibility for our actions, our own failures. Why is that? What kind of testimony is that? See, and, and it leads me, you know, confirms this thought that I have that when Christians say they're following Christ, they are not following the Christ of the Bible. They're following something else. And that's the impression that atheists are getting of us. So I responded to this guy and I said, which is the same thing any Christian would say if they were actually led by Christ and not by the imaginary false model of God passed down by churches over the centuries. And I've said also in this thread elsewhere, I said, if you are, you know, I probably, for this dude who posted this original post, the OP, I probably join atheists in rejecting his false model of God for the same reasons that the atheists reject it. I don't reject God, but I join the atheist in rejecting the false God that is presented by most professing Christians. I have no, I have no need for that kind of God in my life. I'm looking for something that's real, for something that actually can give me wisdom in my life. And when I was following a false model of God in my previous life, pretty much up to about the age of 39, it was not doing me any good. It wasn't doing me any good at all. It was not adaptive. It was not real. It insulated me from reality. It insulated me from the proper choices that I should be making in life rather than connecting me to things. It was robbing me of meaning rather than affording me meaning in my life. And it took, it took a series of tragedies for me to wake up to that. It, it took a series of tragedies in and around my own life in order for me to wake up to that. So this guy comes back and he says, he says, Kevin, anything you have about Christ was passed down by the church over the centuries, and it probably doesn't represent the views of the earliest Christians whose thoughts are lost to history. I'm like, oh, really? Now, that's also what, now this is atheist number two. Somebody else thought this, okay? I'm like, well, he's presuming that I'm getting my beliefs about Christ through the church, which a lot of Christians do. And that is a huge mistake, okay? <laughs> That's a huge mistake. So my response, I posted it so I can make it bigger over here. And this is something I actually responded in that thread. This over here on the left is, is what you just saw on that page. I just made it smaller and kept it there for reference. But what I said was, I'm approaching this situation presuming the same thing, that anything passed down through the church is a bunch of bunk and is disconnected from how it originally was. But there are ways to see through and around such things. For example, PBS even has a special on the Jesus of history as opposed to the Jesus of religion. There are books like The Verdict of History, which covers 17 historical references to Jesus Christ outside the Bible. I personally don't believe anything that came through any church since they started writing creeds or confessions. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the things that they happen to repeat that are true. I'm talking about the things that are unique to propositional Christianity rather than participatory Christianity. But the concept of the Logos, starting with Heraclitus, finds its way to us through John. If you look at John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word he's using there is Logos. In the beginning was the Logos. And Logos was with God. Now, Greek society at the time, he's writing in Greek, Greek society was familiar with the concept of the Logos and the oneness of all things and the Logos as God. They're already familiar with that concept. And John, who's writing the Gospel of John, jumped right on that concept and said, 
the word, the logos, same one Heraclitus was talking about, became flesh and dwelt among us. We talked in another video, uh, I think it was last week, how a lot of people think that the wisdom of this world, well, the wisdom of this world, <laughs> they think that it was like the, the they, they've thrown out the baby with the bathwater and dismissing all the things that some of the Greek society had to offer. If you think of people like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, etc. and so forth. But you have to remember that they rejected these people. Heraclitus was a divergent thinker from those who had gone before him, and he was, he was countering those who had gone before him. They disliked Socrates so much that they put him to death. Okay, And so the, the wisdom of the world at that time was actually they were espousing sophistry. There's somebody in the comments section of YouTube right now accusing me of following after the wisdom of the world, but they are the ones that are pursuing sophistry in their approach. And, and so the wisdom of the world is this sophistry thing. John here seems to think that those who are this concept of the logos is the right thing to think about. And the wisdom of the world that 1 Corinthians 1 puts down is the sophistry. It, and what is that today? It's people who are die hard committed to sets of propositions like your typical independent fundamental Baptist, your typical Calvinist. Those kinds of people are, are committed to you know, die hard sets of propositions. And they, when you talk to them, you're not talking to a real person. You're talking to a, an avatar of those ideas who do nothing but manipulate semantics in order to try to turn everything back to that set of ideas. There is no real person there that has a real opinion. You'll never hear that person's real opinion. They don't even know what it is. They, they might as well not even be there. Any other person with that that's committed to that set of ideas, like Calvinism or staunch independent fundamental Baptistism, any of that kind of thing, anybody else, share, you, could, you could just substitute them. And you may have different level of expertise or you know, post -hoc, more clever post hoc rationalizations, but you're essentially getting a recapitulation of the exact same thing. You're not getting a real boy. There's, they're, they're all Pinocchios. None of them have turned into real boys. They're all simulated thinking. And that's what we want to get away from. Now, the first Christians, they were called the followers. I don't know what just happened there, but we're going to undo it. They were called, the first followers of Christ were called the followers of the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we've covered many times on this channel how that stuck with them throughout the book of Acts. What you never find, you never, when Paul is leaving somewhere, he says, it, Philippians 3, 17-ish, he never says, here's the statement of faith and the creed that we wrote down that you need to follow. Make sure you never deviate from these propositions. You never get anything like that. He says, mark those which walk the way we do and use them as an example for the how. It's about a how. It's an interactive how type thing with procedural, perspectival, and participatory knowing, not this propositional set of beliefs. If there was a set of beliefs that could pass down an end-all, be-all, everything, he would, instead, of, instead of praying in Ephesians 3 for people to be able to comprehend the thing, he would have just gave us the set of beliefs. But there isn't a set of beliefs, you see? There isn't one. He would have just left it to us. He would have just left that with the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. He would have just left the Philippians with that before he got his head cut off. But there isn't one, okay? That's what you've got to get. The, the creation of, of the creeds and confessions within Christianity is, is an artifact of the biggest falling away that the Christian church has ever done to the point where those who are ensconced in that mindset could rightly be said not to be any more of a church than a car dealership or a crack house. Now, this same Logos can manifest itself in conversations. The same Logos that was made flesh and dwelt among us, it can manifest itself in conversations that are had in real time today with good faith interlocutors. I can have a conversation with somebody right now and I can sense the manifestation of the Logos as a, as a, as a supernatural third between us. It's there, something I can interact with. It's something that we can both subjectively and transjectively perceive and agree upon what we perceive. It's not a shared illusion, okay? Something like that. So, sense-making of such things, 
making sense of such things. Somebody took this word sense making in one of the anti Kevin Thompson videos, which are pretty hilarious. How how far they have to go. Somebody was getting onto me for using the word sense making, like you're not supposed to make sense of things. All we're doing here is using two English words that say we, need, we it is our responsibility to make sense of what's going on. That's, that's all we're saying. Somebody was denigrating me for, for using this phrase, connecting me to some, I don't know, something that's satanic or Hindu or psychological something. I don't know, whatever it is. The denigrating sense making. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. Whatever happened there? Now, sense making of such things requires does require a bit of effort. I personally don't let bad branding, I'm telling this guy, I'm telling this atheist, I personally don't let bad branding from a bunch of religious ignoramuses ruin a good and helpful thing. Like the Logos, and you shouldn't either, atheist, the Logos is a good and wonderful thing. Jesus Christ is a good and wonderful thing. And I'm all for getting to the history of Jesus, and there are enough resources to where you can. And the Bible itself, if you separate it from the nonsense that has come through the church, is actually a great resource to get in touch with the Jesus of history. And I highly recommend that people do that. And what this shows you, though, what this line of, of talking from these people shows you is that what these people are rejecting is the same thing I'm rejecting. They are atheists and I am not. They are rejecting what the, church, the so-called church has falsely passed down that is not the real Christ. I reject that, too. Now, what I'm asking you to do is to also become aware of that, become cognizant of that, and bring yourself to the level of awareness to where we separate. We need to very consciously separate the Jesus of churchianity over hundreds and hundreds of years, all the way back to the Nicene and Apostles' Creed, the, you know, the, the first backsliding, if you will. Separate ourselves from that Jesus and God and connect ourselves to that which is so, which cannot be captured in any such model. You need to understand that. But tell, I'm not asking you to change out one model of God for another. I'm asking you to not have one, you see, which is quite a different thing. 1 Corinthians 15 is the famous, is the famous passage. And I, I'm, what I want to leave here with today is is an admonition to us, to me, to me and to you, that we walk away from this session with a more fervent commitment to witnessing the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our life, in our temporal life on this earth with God working through us. Okay, That's what I want to walk away from here with. The most famous, the... the what you would call the classic passage on the resurrection and the classic passage on the gospel even. 1 Corinthians 15, the entire chapter, is the most classic passage. It's, in other words, the classic passage is what some theologians call the passage where you get the most information about a particular thing to which all other references to that concept would tie, would, you would go back to that chapter for reference and disambiguation, that sort of thing. 1 Corinthians 15. We have the gospel, and Paul defines the gospel that he delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. By the way, all the stuff we have going around out there, um, <laughs> place your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Well, let me tell you something. When, when Christ was on the cross and he said, it is finished, he had not yet risen from the dead, which means nobody could be saved. The, cr the cross did not and could not save anybody. You need to understand that. The resurrection, we should be saved by his life, Romans 5.10. Okay? And we're saved by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which only comes to people who believe, which nobody was believing at that time. And don't take that comment too far either. You understand? Hopefully you understand what I'm saying, because when Christ said it is finished, the resurrection hadn't happened yet. And, okay, he was seen of Cephas, he was also seen of the twelve, and he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, uh, but some are fallen asleep, in other words, some of those guys are dead. After that, he was seen of James and all the apostles, last of all, he was seen of, of me as one born out of due time, it's a very interesting phrase, we're not, we're not going to get into that. Um, that. That could have something to do with the end times, not just the fact that Paul wasn't with the rest of the apostles. For I am the least of the apostles that am not me 
uh, meet or suitable to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, if we keep going. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection from the dead? If there be no resurrection from the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. And we are found false witnesses of God, because we testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he, hath raised, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they which also are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Now, what do I want to do here? I want to go to the end of the chapter. The very end of the chapter. Therefore, my beloved brethren. Therefore, my beloved brethren. Because he goes through, and I'm, I have all the text here. Okay, For the sake of time, I, hope you, I want you to read 1 Corinthians 15 and understand all this stuff. And what are we looking at here? We're looking at a whole bunch of information here where Paul kind of gets into the metaphysics of the, of the fact of the resurrection of Christ and of the fact of him being the first fruits and of the fact that those who believe in Christ will be raised up the last day, kind of like John chapter 6 type stuff, okay? And it's tempting because the metaphysics is kind of gone into it here a little bit. Now, what I would like to do, though, I've recently been exposed to the idea through... I'm not going to tell you through who, but because um, <laughs> it's a theosophical writer and uh, everybody would be getting upset, okay? The people who, who drink like this, uh, Gideon's 10,000, would be getting upset and I kind of want to drag them along. I want to help them transition rather than think everything is the devil. It's interesting though that it's like fundamentalist type Christianity, propositional Christianity, whether it's Calvinism, Independent Baptist, non-Calvinism, any, any of that stuff that's, that's proposition-based, it's, it's like they have demonized every form of Christian growth past a certain stage. It's almost like the movie Logan's Run where they just, as soon as you turn 30, they kill you. It's like once, <laughs> once you pass a certain stage of growth, these kinds of groups now start to call you the devil. And so every, every type, every instantiation or artifact of growth that could exist beyond a certain degree, other disciplines and traditions own it because Christians have abandoned it. Okay? And I'm talking about fundamentalist style. There are, there are traditions of Christianity that have branched out into those things. But when we start talking about these things, we start getting accused of, of branching off into demonic, devilish things. That it's almost like they're committed to staying in preschool, and anybody who graduates to elementary school is, is automatically the devil. Because being in the second grade is demonic, and everybody knows that, that kind of thing. And that, that really worries me, and I want, to, I want us on this channel, you and me, to transition out of that. I want us to go on. I want us to press toward the mark and keep growing, become a man, put away the childish things. That's what I want us to do. I want us to become more like Christ. What I want us to do. So this metaphysical thing, he does talk a lot about the metaphysics. And there's nothing wrong with talking about the metaphysics. And I, I talked to somebody recently who was all hung up on the metaphysics and they wanted to teach a Sunday school class and they were consulting with me about how to present this kind of stuff. And I told him, here's what I would do. I wouldn't really deal with the metaphysics of it, especially because they're in a Baptist church where everybody who's going there pretty much already accepts the metaphysics of it, right? So what I want to do is I want to use this same information that is presented in 1 Corinthians 15 and I want to extract from it an admonition for how we can witness the resurrection in our life. In our life. Notice this phrase up here in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, where Paul says, I die daily. Okay? I die daily. What does that mean? And I know there's a lot of religious components to it, but there's something that, you know, Paul went through an ego death. Okay? Another, uh, so he was he had a lot of clout. He had a lot of recognition um, as a Pharisee, a Pharisee sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. Oh yeah, what I was going to say before about this growth thing. There's the the idea that I had. I never really got into that. I got a little sidetracked. But the idea that I've been exposed to is that Paul he is writing from a Jewish mystic mindset, having sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was 
likely inducted after the age of 40 into the mystical aspect of Judaism. And if you are familiar with that and start to read Paul with the understanding that he's writing from that mindset, some of what he writes makes a whole lot more sense. You know, people say what Paul writes is difficult to be understood. Peter said that. Peter said that. Paul's writings are difficult to understand. Well, if you understand the Jewish mysticism mindset from which Paul may have been writing, and I'm saying that as a suggestion, then it clears up a lot of what he's saying. And... (laughs) Yeah, we'll talk about sources, where I read about this some other time, after after I find more people who are drinking the water from their hand and not lapping it up with their tongue. Because the ones lapping it up with their tongue seem to be most vehement with their feedback. <clears throat> I die daily. Now, Paul had a big ego death, so he had all this clout as a big Pharisee, and he was, you know, persecuting Christians, and all that went away you know, almost literally overnight after the road to Damascus a few days later, and then his whole life changes there. And he basically died. He basically, like the Paul that was, the Saul that was, is that dude was gone. He was not there anymore. And I would suspect that there are some of you, I have, I have a transition in my life that's like that. There are some things that happen to where if you look at the before and after, the person that I was is almost completely gone, and the person that I am is completely different. The person that I am would not get along well with the person that I was, or vice versa, okay, in certain ways. And maybe I'm overstating that, but something like an ego death. And there can be an ego death that happens in your life that could be triggered by something major, such as the death of a family member or the loss of a career, Um I say loss of career, not just the loss of a job, but like a loss of a major thing. Um, death of a family member, maybe a divorce, maybe a, a, or several divorces of some close ones, or maybe uh, unexpected bouts with mental illness. That I mean, mental illness can really mess some things up and cause a lot of tragedies. All right, I've seen that happen in multiple families across years and years, and just this ever this ever blooming recapitulation of tragedy after tragedy after tragedy begetting more tragedies and tragedies this is the most horrible thing you could ever see and some of these kinds of things can change you well once you kind of get the knack for having undergone an ego death or two you can get to the point where you can intentionally have this ego death to where paul is doing this daily all the things that he says he counts them as but dung and if he were talking in the vernacular today, he'd say, man, that ain't, you can fill in the blank there. He was speaking very, <laughs> very vulgar way there. Uh, so that's, that's Paul's view on this thing. Now, if you look at the last verse in the chapter, he says, therefore, therefore, because of what I've just told you, because of all these facts and metaphysics, here's what I want you to do, right? Ears perking up. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable. What does that mean? That does not mean double down and commit to the set of beliefs that you have. That's not the point. Look what he says next. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You keep, instead of blooming tragedies out of your life, you need to start blooming good things out of your life. Taking responsibility for things and uh, like putting money in the bank and it starts to gain compound interest and it starts to get better. You start doing things that make things better And those better things give you affordances to do more good things, which also make things better, which give you more affordances to do more good things, which make more things better. And so you're always abounding. You have this life more abundantly, like in John 10, 10. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. When? Just the afterlife and eternal life? I don't think so at all. I'm going to show you some passages in a couple of minutes. Which, which lay this out, that the abundant life that you should be living should be happening now. Not just the transcendent life that happens after you die, which you can't prove to anybody here. I'm talking about the temporal life that you are living right now. You should be abounding in that. You should have life more abundant right now for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now I want to go back to the middle of the chapter where he says, we are, <laughs> yes, And we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified 
that God hath raised up Christ, whom he hath raised not up, if there be if so be that the dead rise not. So the controversy that he's dealing with, some people saying that the dead don't rise, and Paul saying that's a problem. We know that they do, and here's why. So he's giving you the logic behind that. But there's this concept here of being a witness of God. We have testified of God that he raised up Christ. We want to be witnesses of that. How is it? Now I want you to imagine, I want you to do a thought experiment what if you had to be a witness of that, testifying, witnessing that God raised up Christ, but you weren't allowed to do it with anything that you said? Because it's easy, and this is what I was telling the person, it's easy to say things. It's easy to say, oh, Jesus was born of a virgin, he was crucified, he died and rose again three days later, and he's the first fruits of them that would sleep, and then those who believe in him, we're going to have resurrected bodies too, Okay. Well, you can say that all day long, but your life needs to reflect the power of the resurrection. Your life needs to be a witness of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just saying it is lip service, and everybody knows that talk is cheap. There is a million different narratives out there. There's all kinds of different ways to chop up facts and data. There's all kinds of narratives about all kinds of things to do and not to do with Jesus Christ. So you saying something about Christ to other people, let me, let me give you a hint about this. You need to understand this. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't to them. It's not making a difference. Just saying it, okay? I'm not saying that there's no power in the word of the Lord. I'm not saying that the word of the Lord returns void. I'm not saying any of that stuff. What I'm saying is that Talk is cheap, and when you just say stuff and it does not reflect in your life, it just uh, just goes by the wayside. When I was in Kentucky, Pastor Dooley used to say, you are writing the gospel one chapter a day by the things that you do and the words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Tell me, what is the gospel according to you? There's some, there, and that is happening. People are reading your life, and if your life is not a testimony, is not a witness to the, to the resurrection power of God through Jesus Christ, then the words that you say don't mean anything. Most of the people running around, running their mouth, holding up the signs, repent or perish, and all this kind of stuff, they, they see, the world sees that. The world sees that talk is cheap. You're out there running your mouth. They see a bunch of ideologically possessed fools. But to ideologically possess ignoramuses who many times don't have agency in any other area of life. So they've committed themselves to this thing. That's what they see. They don't see any reason to listen to what they have to say. Well, we have to live by faith. Yeah, I know. I know you can come up with all kinds of reasons to not actually live out Christ in your life. You can come up with all kinds of reasons to do that. And if that's what you're committed to, I'm not talking to you, okay? If that's what you're absolutely committed to and you will never change, and you don't want to live out the power of the logos in your life, just turn off this channel and go watch something else and don't even come back. What we're trying to deal with here, we're trying to deal with people who, who are actually trying to be like Christ, not have a set of beliefs that they can cram down everybody's throat, but actually be like Christ and be a witness of Jesus Christ through what they say and what they do. What does that mean? Now we've talked about the four kinds of knowing on this channel. And the four kinds of knowing is something everybody intuits automatically. It just doesn't usually get broken out that way. If you're ever filling out a job application and you look at the job description, it says you must have 10 years experience in this field. What they are saying is that we value participatory knowing. That's what they are saying. They're also value, valuing um, procedural knowing because if you've done this for 10 years, you should know the procedures of what happens here. And they'll say, must work together well as a team, okay? Now they're valuing, valuing perspectival knowing, okay, among other things. So these are, these are types of knowing. People think that we've made these up or that it's a new thing. No, all we're doing is calling our awareness to what we already are doing to become more cognizant of it and then we can see this thing that's already happening. We can start to use it as a lens to look through to clarify and simplify things for us, help them make it more clear. 
So if you are if you are preaching Jesus with your mouth, you're preaching the resurrection of Jesus with your mouth, but you don't have any kind of participatory or perspectival or procedural evidence to which those words are pointing that people can see in your life, then your words are empty and you are puffed up with knowledge. It's like having money that can't buy anything. It's like being out there with monopoly money trying to buy groceries or a car or a house or something. People are going to laugh at you. Yeah, you have it. Yeah, it's there. You can wave it around in everybody's face. You can give everybody a bad day by cramming it down their throat, but you can't buy anything with it, okay? If you it, propositional knowing is the currency of the other kinds of knowing. It is absolutely helpful, it's absolutely necessary. It's one of the main things that separates us from the animal kingdom, okay? Very very wonderful thing, but by itself it is a very disorienting and useless thing. Okay? By itself it has to be the four kinds of knowing have to be interactive. You have to be going back and forth between the four kinds of knowing in your life all the time. And that is one of the, one of, there's many different ways people can define wisdom, but one of the components of wisdom is knowing how to move back and forth between the different kinds of knowing at all times, at all times, okay? So people hear what we say and they think we're disparaging propositional knowing. We are not. We're not at all. We are encouraging all four kinds of knowing. The problem is with modern Christianity, it is just propositional knowing. So you can testify all day long. You can testify and be a witness of the resurrection of Christ with your mouth all day long. And it's not going to matter. It's like monopoly money. You need to have something participatory, perspectival, and procedural to which those words point. The power of the resurrection of Christ in your life. That's what needs to happen. Paul said, Not as though I had already attained or either were already made perfect, but I follow after, that if I may apprehend for that which I am also apprehended of Christ, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that pressing ought to be evident in your life. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, in other words, fully mature, fully ready, be thus minded. And if, any, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, because not everybody is mature, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, stick with it, okay? If you're, if you're listening to this channel and it is not sounding like, you know, the typical statement of faith style Baptist non-denominational type of Christianity that you're used to, yeah, you are otherwise minded, but stick with it. God will reveal this to you. Stick with it, okay? Hang in there. Hang in there. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. How? How? Okay? So there's a, there's a how-ness to this. There's a participation. There's a perspectival, there's understanding other people. There's a growth aspect to Christianity where we are supposed to grow up in Ephesians 4.15. And when I was a child, I spake as a child and understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And in Hebrews chapter 5, there is a time when you ought to have been teachers, but now you have to go back and have one teach you again. Strong meat belonging to them who are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised both to discern good and evil. This needs to happen in your life. Um, 1 Timothy 4.8 Paul tells Timothy, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, this temporal life right here, life more abundantly, and of that which is to come. The problem with Christianity that I've been exposed to a lot is that it is just focused on that which is to come. If that's you, if that's you, I want you to stop focusing so much on that. I'm not saying remove that from the furniture of your mind. What I'm saying is what I want your focus to be, your relevance realization, your salience landscape. I want you to focus on manifesting the power of Christ's resurrection in your temporal life right here, right now. So that what? So that thy profiting may appear to all. 
The power of Christ's resurrection in your life ought to profit you. It ought to be visibly profitable to you to where, and I'm not saying you just get more money. What I'm saying is that you, it is obviously that you are qualitatively being a better person than you were in the past. That would be obvious. You're making better choices. You are suffering less than you were. I had to make difficult choices where there was no clear right answer. I could either let my kids continue to be illiterate or I could make this decision which I always vowed I would never make. I had to choose one, okay? No right answer. And that's what life throws at you sometimes. Life throws at you these kinds of things and you have to, act, you have to actually act in wisdom to know what to do about this kind of thing. And there is, no, there is no set of rules that you can follow. And your life should be a pattern. If you're following Christ and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, there should be a pattern in your life of, of making something, of facing tragedy and making something out of it. You know, life gives you a lemon, make lemonade kind of thing. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and purity, till I come... Give attendance to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. So if you do commit yourself to these things, it has an effect on your life. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Now think about the power of the resurrection of Christ in your life. Think about this. But if the spirit of him, God, that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Philippians 2, we find out that it is him which worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And if the spirit of God is dwelling in you, he will also, just like he raised Jesus up from the dead, he will quicken, which means to make alive, will make alive this mortal body to live the life more abundant. Therefore, my, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are you led by the Spirit of God? We talked before, uh, either last video, video or a couple videos ago, about, about a little girl acting out the spirit of mother. Okay? And when she's doing that, she's not just acting out, she's not just mimicking her exact mother, but she's taking a combination of all the exposures to any kind of mother that she's seen, whether it's on a cartoon or a movie or somebody else's house or at church or at the playground. She's seen a lot of other mothers besides her own, and she's she can then, when she's pretending to play, she can act out the spirit of mother when she's doing that. So what we are doing We are acting out the spirit, the spirit of God. We're led. We're acting out the spirit of the highest value. And when we can conceive of that and have an imaginal view of what that looks like for what we should do, be, and become, we start to act that out, okay? And when you are acting that out, moving toward that imaginal frame of reference to what that is and what it looks like, you are led by the spirit of God, by the spirit of the Logos who is in you. So, This is what we want to be a witness to in our life. If we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we want to manifest the power of that resurrection through that spirit quickening our mortal bodies to in this world, in this life, doing something for God. I'm pretty fed up with Christians who, they're self-righteous, they're not doing anything wrong, you see, they're not cussing, they're not wearing their pants around, you know, hanging them down by their thighs. And they're, they don't have tattoos, right? And they don't watch rated R movies. But they're also not doing anything for God. They're not doing anything for God. They're not making an agentic difference in the arena because of the power of the Spirit working through their life. They're not positively doing anything for God. And by the way, when you positively do something for God, you're going to come across things telling you this, Christian, you're going to come across things to where you have to make decisions, to where you have to take on something in your life that you would rather not be there. You could have sat at home and stayed on your fat, blessed assurance and not done anything for God, but when you go out there and make a move, there's going to be tough choices to make. 
and you're going to have to help people make tough choices. You're going to have to make tough choices. And people are going to disagree with those tough choices, and they're going to say that, oh, you sinned because you did this, you made this choice. And that choice wouldn't even have been had to be made if you weren't out there trying to do something. That's going to happen. And you need to be ready for that. All right? <clears throat> This looks small, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and I'm going to get rid of uh, everything from here down and then I'm going to try to make this bigger so that you can see this. Make this a little bit bigger and I apologize for the small font. I'm going to put this at 23 font. 1 Corinthians. Two, three, one through four, two. Listen very closely to this. Now, what we're going to do over here? What did we do? We left off on um, verse number twelve. So over here, we're going to take verse eleven and up, and we're going to get rid of this here, and then we're going to make this bigger. All right. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some other epistles of? commendation to you or letters of commendation from you now listen what he says ye are our epistle written in our hearts known and read of all men the people the people are known and read of all men people looking at your life the way you live how do you respond to tragedy in other words the pattern when i keep saying this tragedy thing the pattern of jesus christ is that he took on responsibility and the cost of that responsibility it killed him he gave up his life but then he bounced back with a resurrection. That's the pattern. The pattern is that you take on responsibility, and that responsibility costs you something. And it might cost you something that looks bad. There's a very famous person who got addicted to barbiturates um, because of some tragedy that was undergoing in his life. It looks bad, but now he's at a place where he's, he's out for two years. Now he's bouncing back. You should know who I'm talking about. All right? Pretty famous person. Now he's bouncing back. That is the pattern. That's a pattern of Jesus Christ. People ask if that person's a Christian or not. He is living. He is a living testament to the pattern, to the power of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in his life. He suffered a proverbial death of, con of sorts and has resurrected from it and come back. And that's what you need to do. If you're following the pattern of Jesus Christ in your life, that's what it looks like. That's what happens. Something takes you out, something takes you down, and you come back. That's the power of the resurrection of Christ in your life. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us. what Are we supposed to be writing creeds and confessions? No. We're supposed to be writing on the tablet of transformed lives. That is what we should be writing and passing down to the next generation. Not a list of beliefs for people to you know, use to virtue signal and backstab each other and conduct witch hunts, which is all that's been happening since people started, since creedal Christianity became a thing, the first great backsliding of the church. We, that, that never got passed down to us. Now, what we are supposed to pass down, well, if you have a message to write, write it on the tablet of transformed lives. That's how we write our messages in Christianity. That's how we pass them to the next generation. You are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink. No statements of faith here. No creeds. No confessions. But with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust we have through Christ to God word that we are sufficient to ourselves to think anything of ourselves. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. See, as soon as you start talking about God doing something in and through your life, people are going to start saying that, oh, you're boasting in your own sufficiency. No, our sufficiency is of God. That's why we are asking God to save us. That's why we're asking God to live in and through us. That's why it's important as a Christian, if God is working in and through you, stop, stop thinking just, you know, we look toward the heavens from whence cometh our help. In the New Testament, it's a little different than that. In the New Testament, there's something in and through you, which means you need to get to know yourself so that you know what's you 
and you know what's God in you working in there. You need to know what that is. You have to know yourself. Now, if you take that phrase, know yourself, anywhere else, people are going to link you to mysticism, try to claim you, you know, you're worshiping the devil now. But you have to. You have to search yourself, examine yourself, is what Paul says, to see whether you be in the faith. See if you are connected to the things that have meaning. Examine yourself. See if that spirit's really in there. See if you are yielding to that spirit. That thing is inside. I go to all these praise and worship services. You know, when Paula and I go to church, we see you know, in the preaching and the messaging and the lessons and the, and the singing, we see all these references to God where God is this entity that's on the outside. Well, God's omnipresent. But what that also means is he's on the inside. He's in and through you. You're created in the image of God. In him, in him we live, move, and have our being. Created in and through you. You need to make sure, if you are going to do anything, agentically, you need to find the God that's in there. And I'm not saying the God like there's a different one in there. I'm saying you need to find out how, that's, how that embedding of God in you, you need to find out all the who, what, when, why, how, and all that about what that is. You need to do some introspection. And when you're, when you're listening to praise music or Christian music, whatever it is, and they're talking about these kinds of things, play with the words in your mind and start directing these kinds of things inward to the Holy Spirit that's indwelling you and that power that is in you. Figure out how to bring that to life. Think about that when you're meditating on some of those words and lyrics that people have written. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament. Able ministers. How? By the way that we live. Not of the letter. Not of the letter. Where's my little prop? It's way across the room over there. <laughs> not of the letter. Not Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. But of the Spirit. Not of the statement of faith at your church. Not in the what we believe section on your church's website. But of the Spirit. And the Spirit is alive. And then what does it do? It moves like wind, according to Jesus. It bloweth with us whoever it listeth. And thou canst not tell where it cometh or whence it goeth. For the letter killeth. That's why if you have a statement of faith, if you have creedal Christianity, what are they doing? They're debating. They're stabbing each other in the back. They're virtue signaling. They're conducting witch hunts. They're kicking each other out. Who's being edified? Nobody. It's all argumentative. It killeth. But the Spirit giveth life. Are you listening to me? People ask me, they write me, and they write me emails all the time. And they say, I need to find a good, somebody just wrote me the other day. I need to find a good church that preaches sound doctrine and goes soul winning. Look, if they're out there and they're of the letter, like this, the letter killeth, man. It kills. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know. The thing that needs to be happening in Christianity isn't exactly widespread. <laughs> we, we're all kind of victimized in a way by the great backsliding of the professing church. The professing church is, is, is no more the church than, than a car dealership or a crack house. Okay? But the Spirit giveth life. Okay? Seeing then that we have such hope. And I'm not skipping over this. Okay? I'm not skipping over this because I'm trying to avoid it or anything like that. Just for the sake of time, I expect that you do read this. Seeing then that we have such hope... We use great plainness of speech. Now we're going to go into the second part of this and seeing then. So that's verse 12. We use great plainness of speech. Then we go into this deal where the Old Testament is kind of blinding, blinding the minds of those that read it because the veil isn't taken away. Now where that spirit is and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But where the spirit of Calvinism and statement of faiths and creeds is, there is bondage. Is bondage. People say we are slaves. The Calvinists are always like, you know, oh, we're slaves to sin. You still are, buddy. If you're a Calvinist, you're still slaves to sin. You're still slave to things made up by man, and your your fallen mind can't work your way out of it. Okay? Turn to Christ. Am I saying these people aren't saved? I'm saying no such thing. Everybody, everybody's looking. Everybody's looking for something to accuse you of. You know why they're looking for something to accuse you of? Because the letter killeth. And they're not following Christ. They're following a bunch of letters. And the letter killeth. That's why I have to give so many disclaimers on this channel. Because there's so many 
hypocritical, virtue-signaling, professing Christians out there just itching for me to say something they can use against me. And that is a testament to the type of Christianity that they are advocating and living. It kills. It's virtue-signaling. It's backstabbing. It's rivalrous. It's antagonistic. It's debating. That's, that's not Christianity. That's not following the way. Okay? If you're one of those people out there just, just looking for anything that I say that you can use against me and prove that I'm some kind of heretic, you are demonstrating that you don't have Christ flowing through you. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, not bondage to creeds and confessions. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed, are changed, even into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So if you are, if you are a Christian and you're genuinely following Christ, you're not following the letter, but you're following the Spirit, there should be iterations of growth as each iteration you become more and more like Christ. And that ought to be the pattern of your life. Iterations of growth where you qualitatively, not quantitatively, where you're just adding a bunch of information to your head at seminary. No. That's one of the most horrible things you can do to yourself. It's just propositional knowing. And you're becoming puffed up with vain knowledge that isn't pointing to anything real like procedural, perspectival, or participatory knowledge. Those are the real things. And you get puffed up with these things. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. That's the sophistry. Okay? Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. That's the sophistry. Some people think that because you're quoting scripture, that that makes everything that you're saying perfect and well and good. And you can see people using scripture as a weapon. They're using it maliciously and they're using it to hurt people. And then when you try to stop them, they play the victim card. Oh, I'm just trying to preach the truth of Christ to keep people from being deceived. But you don't like that apparently. You must not like the truth. That kind of nonsense is not the spirit of Christ. It is the spirit of something else. Okay? But by manifestation of the truth... What is that manifestation of the truth? Manifestation to show, manifest, to show, to demonstrate the, your life. Overcoming tragedy, taking responsibility, taking a tragic hit as the cost for that responsibility and bouncing back anyway. The voluntary adoption of responsibility. Manifestation of the truth. And that truth isn't a set of beliefs. It's not a set of statements. That truth is attunement with the logos as it flows through reality. That's the truth. Committing ourselves, ourselves, who? Ourselves. In other words, in, to every man's conscience in the sight of God, you're asking other people, come take a look at this life and tell me what you see. Now, if you can't do that, if you don't feel confident in doing that, maybe you're not confident that the Spirit of God is really working through your life. So what are we doing here? What we are doing is in 1 Corinthians 15, yeah, you could talk about all these metaphysical things about the fact of Christ's resurrection and the fact of our future glorification. But what I wanted to do in this video is for us to be found as true witnesses of God through how we live. Through how we live. And if I could look at one verse one last time to drive this home in Romans chapter 8, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Is that happening? Is that happening in your life? Are you a witness to the power of the resurrection of Christ in your life? Not with what you say, but in your life. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.